Hey there and welcome to DIY Projects with Pete. In this year's rink build video, which is year number four, we'll go over the process of setting up this outdoor rink and then we'll talk about some of the upgrades which include a warming house, taller boards, under ice LED lighting, and some board signage. We'll also talk about outdoor rink maintenance and go over a few tips. I wanna give a big thank you to Nice Rink for sponsoring this year's rink build. They're the supplier of the boards, the liner, and the LED under ice lighting. If you enjoyed today's video, please go ahead and give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel and hit that notification bell so you don't miss a future video. And comment below. I'd love to hear from fellow rink builders about your backyard rink. If you're a hockey player or a skater and have some fun experiences on outdoor rinks to share, please let us know. And I'd love to hear what you think of this year's rink and the upgrades. All right, let's go ahead and get started. This year's rink project began in late September when I staked out the area for the future warming house. It's been a dream of mine for a while now to have a place to warm up and to hang out near the rink, so I decided to make it happen this year. I brought in some gravel and then built the skid foundation. I wanted to build this on skids in case I ever want to move the building to a different spot on the property. Three quarter inch thick OSB was nailed onto the joist to finish the platform or the floor, and then the walls were built using two by four construction. We lifted the walls in place, sheeted them, and then started building the roof. We sheeted the roof in an afternoon, and then some hockey teammates and neighbors stopped over to help lift the big window in place, which would basically enclose the building before the snow arrives. Now moving on to the rink, it was early November and time to get those boards up. The rink is 120 feet long by 60 feet wide, and I measured out the area, checked that it was square, and then pounded stakes in each corner. String line is ran to each stake to form the perimeter of the rink, and then marking paint is used to help line the boards up straight. And if you're wondering, my assistant is our one-year-old black lab named Maddie, and she's always up for working out at the rink. I measured seven feet six inches in from each corner, and that's going to tell you where to start the corner boards if you're using the nice rink board system. The first black bracket gets put in at the seven foot six inch mark, and then a board will rest in the bracket. Now the brackets are best to put in before the ground freezes, so I typically like installing them in late October or early November where we live. The soil where I'm doing the rink is full of clay, so it takes a little more work to get those brackets in, and I end up using a few more taps with the dead blow hammer to help out with the process. This is the fourth year using this setup, and I'm a big fan of the plastic boards because they're super durable. They don't warp or rot or get ruined over time from the weather, and when I'm done with them for the season, I just stack them on a pallet, throw a tarp over them, and they sit outside until it's time to put them up again next year. Each corner consists of three boards, and you can adjust them before staking to get the corner rounded how you want it. And those brackets go in similar to the others, but they're just moved in a ways from the lines. The boards connect to each other using a peg system on the sides of each board, and they go together pretty quickly once you get the hang of it. Now, Nice Rink got in touch with me and let me know they were coming out with brand new four foot tall boards they called Tall Boys, and they'd be getting me the first batch of boards made, but they wouldn't arrive until early December sometime. So they said to install everything like normal since the big boards will fit in the same black brackets and would be easy to swap out when they arrived. So I continued installing the 18 inch boards and brackets as usual. Another upgrade this year was to add snow fences along the east and west sides of the rink. I picked up a bunch of T-posts and then wooden snow fence from our local farm supply store and used a post hole pounder to get each post into the earth. Each fence was rolled out and then zip tied to each post and I read up on snow fence placement and put my four foot tall fences about 100 feet from the rink. If you watched last year's video, which is linked to in the description, you'll see we had a crazy amount of wind and drifted snow, so much that the only way to clear it was to get the skid steer out on the ice since the massive drifts were just so compacted and wind blown. Um, and I figured any way to minimize the drifts would be well worth the investment. And you'll see how they performed later in this video. Once the boards and fences were up, I was able to spend some time on the warming house again. 
I'm showing a quick overview of the warming house build in this video, but a very detailed tutorial is being put together and will be one of the next videos going up on the channel and will be linked to in the description as soon as it's available. It's my top secret shipment that just came in. These are the brand new tall boy boards from Nice Rink. I'm gonna head up to the rink and set them up now. We're doing the taller boards around the two ends where the puck will be shot most often and they'll wrap around the corners and then transition to the shorter boards on the sides. Now to swap out the boards, I simply pulled out the shorter ones around the end and corners. The tall boys boards have a few more supports since they have more surface area to catch the wind and to ensure they stand up nice and straight. Each board has two back support brackets and two feet. The brackets slide into a groove on the back of the board, and then the feet slide through the bottom of the board and into the lower part of each rear bracket. Now, the black brackets do keep the boards lined up nicely and provide some support as well. The transition boards are cut using a circular saw. Simply cut along the groove on the back of the board, and you'll make a total of four transition boards. Do pay attention to orient the cut in the correct direction for each side of the rink. You'll also need to cut one of the rear brackets a little shorter for each transition board. Follow that groove with the circular saw and you'll be good to go. These boards have the same peg system as the shorter ones, so it's no different connecting the boards other than they have a few more pegs since they're taller. Here's a look at the first boards I put together which shows the transition and how the yellow bumper goes over the top. Later that morning, my buddies Christian, Scott, and Sam all stopped over to help get the rest of the tall boys boards up. We got an assembly line going to speed up the process and then we made the rest of the transition cuts and then installed each board around the ends and the corners. Now these guys all play men's league hockey and they've been a lot of help in getting the rink set up. Where the transition boards met up with the short boards, we needed a little team effort to get the pegs to line up perfectly, but everything ended up locking in place and worked like it should. Cheers. <laughs> we decided to tackle one more project while I had the help, so we spaced five 10-foot tall T-posts out evenly along each end and zip-tied the netting to each post to help keep the pucks in. We used black pipe insulators to cover the T-posts and make them have a more finished look. The last step with the boards was to stake them into the ground using mushroom-style stakes through the holes in the feet of the rear bracket. A wood stove was installed as the primary heat source, which turned out to be good timing as it was starting to get pretty cold out there. Then I did all the wiring for the building, put in some insulation, uh, beamed high-speed internet from the main house to the warming house so we could watch hockey and listen to music out there. Then I did a tongue and groove ceiling, um, installed lighting and speakers, and lastly finished up with the wood stove installation. Netting was installed in front of the three panel window and it's definitely protected it from pucks more than a handful of times already. Plywood was used for the interior walls and I used some channel siding for the accent wall behind the TV and bar area. I then painted the plywood a light gray color. Rubber horse stall mats were cut to size and then used for flooring so ice skates can go on it. And lastly trim was added and then we started hanging up flags and some hockey memorabilia. Christmas was getting close and my wife wanted to put a couple trees out by the rink, so I took some scrap metal and welded up stands that could be staked into the ground to withstand our heavy winds. I used nine inch stakes for the smaller tree and then cut quarter inch rebar stakes for the big tree. And it's withstood 65 mile per hour winds so far and it's still standing tall. The cold weather arrived and the temperatures were looking good for the next six to seven days to fill and freeze the rink, so I decided now was a good time to get started. First, I had to clear out about 10 inches of fresh snow so the liner will rest flat on the ground. After snow blowing, I broke up a couple snow clumps and leveled out any extra snow with a push broom. In addition to the rink, I'm really excited about this season are the Nice Rink Under Ice LED lights. I'm installing a center red line, blue lines, a blue center circle, and then white perimeter lighting. Timing is important for putting the lights in as you need to do it right before the liner is installed. I'm telling you this from experience because I had put the red line in to test it out prior to it snowing 
And while I was snow blowing, I was trying to be careful not to hit it. And it ended up getting wrapped up in the snowblower auger. And I had to head out to a local online lighting company named Bird Dog Distributing, who uh, luckily had a patch kit so I could stay on schedule with getting the rink filled. We decided to do a 20 foot diameter circle, which meant we needed about 63 feet of rope lighting. The formulas to figure out circumference and diameter are shown here. And since I knew I had 63 feet of lighting, which forms the circumference, I can divide 63 by 3.14 or pi to find the diameter of my circle, which would be 20 feet. So we measured out 10 feet, which is the radius of the circle um, from the center of the ice rink, painted a line to use as a template, and then put down the lights. My buddy Christian stopped over to help install the under ice LED lighting. The rope lighting is secured to the ground using four inch landscape staples or yard staples and we use them every couple feet for the center circle. For the red and blue lines, Christian held the end of the rope light and then I pulled it as tight and straight as I could. It was only 12 degrees Fahrenheit outside so the rope lighting was pretty stiff and it was not wanting to uncoil and lay straight but we got it as straight as possible and then used the staples about every four to five feet or so. When the ground is frozen, it can be more challenging to get those staples in, but it's still doable. We ran the white perimeter lighting about six inches to the inside of the boards and went around the entire perimeter. And then an extension cord was run out to the center circle to power it. And for each blue and red line, you can run the end under the boards so it can be plugged into a surge protector outside the rink. Since the lights are LEDs, they stay cool and don't use much energy. The LED lights will definitely add a cool factor to any rink and it makes it really neat to skate on in the evening hours. The next morning I got up about 6 a.m. to get the liner installed while it was perfectly calm outside. The liner will be wider and a little longer than the actual dimensions of the rink so it can go up and over the boards. You'll want to use a white colored liner since it reflects sun the best. I rolled it down the center of the rink and then Britt came out to help spread out the liner. The process is pretty straightforward. You just want to get all the wrinkles out so it lays as flat as possible. Any wind is going to turn the liner into a giant sail, so try to time it so the wind doesn't come up in the middle of your install. We basically walk around the perimeter of the rink about three to four times, pulling the liner a little more taut each time. Here you can see Britt pulling the liner up and over the taller boards and then temporarily securing it with some of the yellow bumpers. I was getting excited because starting to fill the rink means skating and backyard hockey will be happening soon. I ran a hose out from the house to the rink and that's how I fill the rink each year. While it started to fill, we walked around the rink and put more bumpers in place to hold the liner. And usually I wait to trim the excess liner, but if you know the wind is going to come up, you might trim some of it so it doesn't flap around. A little tradition we've done over the last three years is to take some of last year's water and to put it into this year's rink. So we're gonna do that. This is from the 2020 slash 21 season. I checked on the rink about 10 p.m. that night and everything was looking great. And the forecast didn't mention anything about high winds or snow coming our way. came up and storm out of nowhere so anyways a little bit of a battle tonight the next evening the rink actually looked a lot better than i thought it would and it had continued to fill with water all day um, and then the weather rolled in again and at least this time i didn't have to trim a liner in the middle of the night but i still had a couple things to fix in the morning due to those high winds a combination of wind, snow, and water aren't ingredients I like to add to the recipe, but it's nearly impossible to prevent sometimes and you just have to roll with the punches. Here's an example of trimming the liner and I did most of it at 2 a.m. in the windstorm uh, with huge pieces that turned into sails, but I had a few small pieces left to trim so I thought I'd show it on camera. Once the rink was filled, it took about seven more days before I could get on the ice for the first time. And it's usually closer to about three or four days, but the warmer temperatures followed by more snow made it take longer to freeze. 
I wanted to get the snow off since it insulates the ice and makes it take longer for the six to eight inch slab to freeze all the way to the bottom. And I wasn't anticipating slush this year, but as you can see, the weight of the snow in a couple of the corners and sides has pushed the ice down and caused water to come back up and to form slush. I used a shovel to try and get rid of the high spots in that area as best as possible. The good news is that it was about five degrees out. So now that all of the snow is off, it's going to freeze super quick. The power broom was then used to remove the rest of the snow. It was pretty bumpy still along one of the sides and corners, but the majority of the rink was in decent shape. We used a metal shovel to help with some of the smaller bumps, and then my good buddy Jake used the weed torch to touch up some problem areas as well. There were some pretty good ridges in the ice, so we decided to go over the whole rink with a new coat, and we'd let it freeze overnight. My brother, nephew, and dad also came out to help. Jake got up in the bucket and put some hockey flags up at each corner. The Vegas Knights flag was a new addition to the rink this year, which was sent from Jeffrey, a hockey fan and subscriber from Las Vegas. We also got an LA Kings flag, a Boston Bruins flag, and a few others from subscribers who sent them in to hang at the rink. We trimmed off the excess liner around the tall boys' boards about an inch up from the ice and then called it a day. The next evening, we had some family and friends over to skate for the first time this season. The warming house ended up being a hit, and everyone had a great time skating, even though it was just negative two degrees outside. When it snows, I start out with my 30 inch snow blower if there's a half inch or more of snow. This gets the snow off quickly and it's faster than shoveling unless you have a bunch of people helping out. Skating on the rink is always good for the ice since the blades break up the bumps, but there was still more to do to continue to improve the bad areas. I hooked the hose up to our hot water faucet and went along the edges to melt some of the bumps. Then I used the bucket dump technique in the corner that had that slush initially. The bucket dump helps to level the area. You'll find that leaving a hose in one area will actually melt through the ice rather quickly. And the bucket dump disperses the water in a couple seconds, which works well for fixing trouble spots as long as you have the time to let it freeze overnight. One of the most popular methods for resurfacing a backyard rink is to use an ice rink resurfacer like the one I'm using here. You hook a hose up to it, and it's basically piping with a bunch of holes at the bottom that let out water. And then a towel drags behind it to help even it out. It usually takes about a half hour to do the rink with the resurfacer, and I always try my best to get as much snow as possible off before resurfacing by using either a metal blade shovel or the power broom. Another method a lot of backyard rink builders use to resurface the ice is a homemade Zamboni built with a water tank and either a tractor, ATV, or cart of some sort. And I turned an old tractor into an ice resurfacer and I use it sometimes as well. I'll link to the video of that project in the description. The tractor is a little underpowered though as it has trouble getting up the hill to the rink from my garage when there's a lot of snow um, and with all that weight. So I may build a version two in the coming years. I've seen a few outdoor rinks with signs and was really excited I could put up a few now that I had those taller boards with the space to add them. I had vinyl decals applied to Lexan for the uh, nice rink logo, which is a clear polycarbonate. And for the other couple signs, I found a sheet of white plastic that the decals would stick to. And then the signs were attached using either screws or bolts, uh, but you probably could use a strong mounting tape if you'd prefer. One of the first signs on this year's boards is for Bauer Hockey, and I want to give them a big shout out for everything they did for our skaters this year. They reached out and sent all sorts of hockey sticks, so everyone who comes to skate at the rink has a stick to use or a new one to try out. And they also sent banners and some cool stuff to help out with the rink, so I just wanted to say thanks for their support. I'm always looking to become more efficient with rink maintenance, and when my friend Brian told me how well his Toro Power Broom worked on their rink, I decided to try and get my hands on something similar. 
I picked up this 27 inch power broom new last year and it worked pretty well, but it always left a little snow in the center where the brushes came together. And this season, I wanted to try and find something a little wider and more heavy duty. Now, new power brooms are pretty expensive, but when I found this lightly used 40 inch wide power broom on Facebook Marketplace, uh, it was a great deal and I knew it'd be perfect for the rink. And I can honestly say it's been the best rink maintenance tool upgrade I've made over the years. It cleans off the ice perfectly before resurfacing, and then I just shovel around the perimeter when I'm done. I still had some areas of the rink that were bumpy from that initial slush, and if I have bad areas like bumps or cracks, I'll always mark them with cones to warn skaters, but I really wanted to fix them, so I tried a new trick that a friend told me that he had heard on a backyard rink forum, uh, so I figured I'd give it a shot. Anything that sits on the ice, like a hockey puck, leaves, or the goals will absorb energy from the sun and then melt into the ice, so this method uses that same thought. Basically, if you lay dark colored tarps or black plastic bags, they should absorb the sun's energy and melt the ice underneath. Now, I experimented with it on a calm 40 degree day, and here's what I found. All right, so it's been about an hour, and this is already looking good. Here you can see a puck, I just did this for reference, but that's melted in probably a half inch. And then we got, a, we got water under here, looking good. Let's run over to this tarp. This is a, probably the bumpiest area on the rink. Ooh, that is great. All right. And here was a, a decent bump as well. Let's see. It's definitely melting down. All right. I'll let you know how it looks after another hour. It's been about two and a half hours and the sun is kind of going behind the clouds. So I'm going to call it good for today because we're going to head out. But Did a great job melting down that bump a little bit to go still, but good progress. And this corner, we'll pull out this, see all the water under there. And while it's still not perfect, it is night and day better than it was. And let's check over here real quick. see that this plastic even melted around there but low spots are okay they can always fill in so looks better still a ways to go but looks better I had mentioned earlier that I put up snow fences this year and here's a recent storm showing the heavy winds we get in our neck of the woods now this particular storm topped out at 62 mile per hour gusts and you could hardly see the other end of the rink the snow fences, though, have been well worth the investment and have definitely minimized drifts on the ice. With all the snow and wind after this particular storm, we still did get some drifts, but they were minimal and the hand snow blower could get through them just fine. Here you can see the three snow fences set up and the drifts on each side of them. Our prevailing winds are from the west, which is on the left side of this video, but we sometimes get gnarly winds that come in from the east and those are the drifts I worry about most. If you're wondering what happens to the rink after the season, here's a clip from last year's thaw. Our rink is usually skatable up until the second or third week of March when the ice melts and it's time to move on to spring. The water will drain back into the earth and then the liner is rolled up and removed and it's a challenge to reuse the same liner for the same size drink due to skate cuts and the liner having being trimmed. So I usually cut the liner in two large sheets and then the last few years have given it to friends who are able to use it for smaller rinks in their backyards. Then I stack the boards, brackets, and bumpers on pallets, cover them with tarps, and store them until next season. Once everything was put away, we planted additional grass so we can use it more in the summertime. And as you can see, it started to come in around June so we could use it for our wedding and summer barbecues. 
And that's a wrap for year four. What started out as an idea and a hill with a six foot slope from one end to the other has turned into a hockey rink and a place to bring family, friends, and local teams together. With a lot of help, each year we've made a few upgrades, we've learned a lot about backyard hockey rinks, gotten people on skates for the first time, and seen countless smiles the moment they get on the ice. It's been a lot of work, yes, but well worth it for the memories it's created. Outdoor rinks are creating memories all around the world, and there are so many amazing and inspiring rinks. Here are just a couple subscribers shared with me. Noah sent in this footage of a rink he helped make for his community in Drammen, Norway. Here's a look at the Hortons ODR near Chicago, Illinois. Here's the Brolin Family Arena in the Minneapolis, Minnesota area. And the Spence Family Rink, which is also in Minnesota. Here's a crew out at the Red Lodge, Montana outdoor rink getting in some hockey. Here's the Rising Family's first season of ice in their backyard. Brady sent in a photo of their family's backyard rink setup. Here's the Coyle family rink in Montana. And lastly, the O'Neill family's amazing setup in New Hampshire. Thanks for sharing your rinks with us, guys. All right, thanks so much for tuning in and checking out this year's rink build video. I hope it inspires you to get out and do some outdoor skating or to build a backyard rink if you live in a cold weather climate. I want to thank all the family and friends that helped out with this year's project and with some of the maintenance. And uh, I want to thank you for taking the time to watch this video and sticking to the end. If you did enjoy it, please go ahead and give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel and hit that bell notification. And please comment below and let me know about your rink experiences. All right, take good care and cheers from Montana.